momentum and that approach to getting those folks involved. This 40% wants to know that this project is real, okay, and that it has merit and it's legitimate, and they make that assessment or determination based on the previous participants. So that previous 40 or 50% has to be in and participating. And we'll come in because we see what's happening and we want to be a part of it and we don't want to be left out. Right? Their motivations are a little bit different. So that back end of that graph is a little bit different. I want, I'm going to be, you know, and we, I ran into this with Malahad in the last year I was there. <clears throat> we had a platinum sponsor who was going to be in for a certain amount of money. Uh, and then out of the blue, we had another platinum sponsor want to come in and participate for no other reason that they wanted to be elevated to that level. They didn't want to be left out of that, of that status, if you like, right? A um, whole different type of motivation. It was a corporate client. Didn't want to be upstaged by this other corporate client, right? Now, we leveraged that, right? Like, you know, we didn't just, we weren't passive about that. <laughs> you know, we were like, hey, these guys are going to be in. What do you, what do you want to do, right? Um, so you got to leverage those relationships. But they don't come in, that last 40% doesn't come in unless that other 50% is in. This 40% doesn't come in unless this 10% is in. Okay? This 5% doesn't come in unless this 5% is in. And so that's how you build the, um, the fundraising strategy or, or process going forward, <coughs> is to make sure that you are <coughs> leveraging each group and activating those groups uh, in a sequential way. <coughs> this group of folks is Cayucat um, proper, if you like. This is the community. Okay? Those folks have to be uh, totally invested and passionate about why the project's happening, how it's going to happen, uh, and, and uh, understand it. And they're the ones that are giving the messaging, right? So, you know, having video uh, and pamphlets and information and a website that conveys the real story of why, right? Changing lives for children, literacy, the importance of that, having young people speak about why this is important in a context or a background that celebrates and recognizes culture and community. Uh, and speaks to the whole, you know, the whole real kind of grandiose notion of, of why this is important. Okay. So I think that's, you know, that, that was for those folks have to be uh, hardwired in and really be active. Without that community being that invested, uh, projects uh, will fail. <clears throat> they also have to be prepared, and this is the other challenge, they have to be prepared to actually go out there and use their network. They have to actually be prepared to go and ask. And that is the challenge. And sometimes for First Nations communities, that's a culturally challenging piece, right, for particularly Aboriginal people to speak um, in a way about themselves that is self, kind of self-promoting or self, um, what's the word, self-aggrandizing, if you like. You're really kind of taught to, be, to sit there and listen uh, and be active, but not actually be out there saying, let's, you know, let's take the lead. So it's interesting to see in a modern context, some of that dynamic shifting where young people are very much more about <coughs> out there kind of driving things. <clears throat> but this network has to actually ask that network. Actually have to ask. And you have to, you have to, you know, you have to really have to sit down and think about what does that look like and how many folks are there and what type of folks are they? Are they your corporate clients? Are they your family, extended family and other First Nations communities? Are there your business associates or just colleagues and people that you know that you have a very direct and intimate relationship with that you can early on go and ask to participate? <clears throat> and part of that ask is not only to ask them to contribute and be invested, but also ask that group, this next group, this 5% here, to do the same on your behalf or to make introductions for you to go, uh, for other folks to go in and make those introductions. So, you know, we work, say, uh, Mal, uh, Cayuca works with, um, is it Interfor? Is it Interfor they work with? Yes. They have really good connections with Interfor. And early indications are that Interfor is prepared to provide a, a significant cash contribution and a resource contribution based on that relationship with Cayuca. So it's a direct relationship. How are you going to then leverage that relationship with Interfor so that you are taught, so that you are, that you are taking that message out to similar players in that industry or sector who might be able to contribute or match or complement what Interfor is doing. And will Interfor be prepared to do that? So you have to nurture that conversation and build that. And sometimes that just takes time. At the 
at the foundation or cornerstone of all of these conversations, regardless of which sector you're in, it's first and foremost about building that relationship, right? People will contribute to a project based on um, their relationship with you first and foremost, or relationship to the project, right? And I think we've all in experienced that intimately, right? Bob asked us to participate. I don't think many of us said to him, well, gee, Bob, let me think about that. I'll, you know, I'll get back to you in a week or two, maybe. Most of us just said, yeah, of course, you've asked, we'll participate. That is, speaks to really to the solidness of that relationship. And in this first instance, those are the type of relationships you really want to be getting on board early and indoctrinating into the whole project and the whole scope <coughs> and building that out. And I think it really also speaks to the importance of groups like Rotary. Because you want to make sure that that network kind of grows exponentially. And so if you can get a Rotary Club supporting a project, you use that network of folks to move beyond this chasm out there into the rest of the world. Okay. <clears throat> so that network's important. Those relationships are critical. And as you move across the spectrum, you'll rely more and more on the story and why it's important. Okay. So we did a lot of our fundraising with corporate clients. Our messaging and our strategy was very different than when I was phoning someone up who, had a, who I had a personal relationship with. Right? And so that messaging has to be different, I think, so to speak to Mike's point, how are you going to message that and what's that going to look like? Right? So it's not just one message, it's multiple messages dialed in to whoever you're talking to. Here, 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 here. This message is very different than this message. It's different than this message. Right? These folks over here are looking for a return on investment that is different than um, the folks here, right, or here. And so over here, it might be things like status, might be things like tax issues or finance issues, right? <coughs> it could be things like guilt, uh, right, <laughs> emotional, right? So it's a different kind of messaging. So, you, you know, I think that's an important distinction as well. That approach is very different. But you always start here. And you don't jump to here, you start here and it's progressive. This could be a two or three year process, I don't know. We haven't mapped it out yet with Kayukit, for example. And that's part of the detail work we need to do to build that stuff up. It's also important to understand that this network that you build here, and this 10%, needs to be as broad as possible. Because as that network goes out and filters out and asks on your behalf, it's diminishing returns, right? I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna ask uh, Scott to ask 10 people, Right? And Scott's going to ask those 10 people to ask some people. And part of that ask, we'd ask those people to ask some people. And it's diminishing returns. It's not like everybody asks two people and you get this kind of you know, critical mass really quickly. It's actually diminishing. So I'll ask 10, the next person will ask 3, and the next person will ask 1. Right? So that core group is really kind of important. So to make sure that network is pretty solid at the beginning and as big as possible in terms of being part of that core kind of piece of... of um, of, uh, of uh, who's, uh, who's, who's solid in terms of the project. It's also important to understand from my experience that um, if you're going to raise a million dollars, you're going to have to, you're going to rely on an 80-20 or a 90-10 or an 85-15 rule where 90% of the folks you talk to are going to give the least return in terms of, of cash or value. Cash, let's say cash. Uh, and that smaller percentage, that 10 or 15 percent, is actually going to give you the most value or the most cash, right? Um, so if you're raising a million dollars, you know, uh, 90 percent of that folks are going to give you 100,000, and that last 10 or 15 percent are going to give you that 900,000. So it speaks again to, I think, the importance of having a good, broad network and not being afraid to ask. That's the other thing. It's just that. You just got to really be prepared to ask. We asked everybody and anybody. If there was a link, if I had a link or you had a link or one of my staff had a link uh, with somebody, they were, they, were, they were asked to make the ask. Uh, and so we knocked on a lot of doors and made a lot of phone calls, but ultimately we reached our objectives. Um, and just don't be afraid to ask. Uh, and understand through the fullness of time what that strategy is really going to look like. So... You know, you're going to need to talk to 50 people to get that one yes, or you're going to need to talk to 10 people to get that first contribution or something like that. Uh, any questions about